Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. My regular listeners will know that we're reading and discussing the book The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, Secretary of the U.S. Navy during the mid-1800s, wrote a book after assessing the most dangerous threats to our constitutional republic, both foreign and domestic. And his conclusion is that if the government of the United States and its free institutions are ever overthrown, it will be by a domestic threat that currently existed in the country at that time, the Roman Catholic Church. As odd and as strange as that may sound, after years of research into this matter, I conclude conclusively that R.W. Thompson knew well about what he was speaking and told the truth, and he backed up that truth with this book. And I highly recommend this book to my listeners, one of the most recommended books in my library, The Papacy and the Civil Power. Getting to be a little difficult to find, and I understand now there are modern-day publishers that are republishing this book. And I highly recommend that you either get a used copy or a new copy of this book. Read it and study it and pass it and share it with friends and family. This is gives this gives us a good understanding of what the new world order really is. It's simply the restoration of the old world order when the popes ruled supreme over the kings of the earth under this idea of papal infallibility as the vicar and replacement of Christ on earth, and that he has the divine right to select the kings of the earth, and they have a divine right to rule under his authority, and they rule the people for his benefit. This is what the New World Order is, simply the Old World Order restored. Now, we were speaking last week about the early days of the papacy and how the papacy was a subject of the Roman emperor, a subject just like all the other people. And under Constantine, in his attempt to overthrow the existing government of Maxentius, used the papacy in a treasonous fashion to overthrow that government. And then Constantine, after becoming emperor, in order to settle a dispute among the Christian factions then in existence and to stabilize his empire, got into an unholy, another unholy alliance and out of which rose supposedly the papacy as a power to be contended with in the Christian world. All of this we've been studying as a basis for our understanding of the steady growth of the papacy to the global power that it is today. And, uh, and we find, without exception, that every single instance given, at least so far in the book, have been uh, usurpations, uh, human contrivances, lies, distortions, rebellions, treason, and every other form of, of uh, unjust uh, acquisition of power. And as we finish this chapter, we'll go on to the next and show at a, a, a success, a, a, a succeeding uh, further treason of the papacy. Treason upon treason, lie upon lie. It's, a, it's an institution built on lies and usurpation because it is not the Church of Jesus Christ. It is the Church of Antichrist. Now, if you're following along in your book and reading along with me, I'm on the fir- I'm, I'll begin with the first full paragraph on page 318. We were talking about the Council of Nicaea and 
the usurpation that the papacy rose out of that in the blatantly forged uh, edition of the canons later, uh, much later than the council. There were 20 canons that were finalized and written in this, uh, in this resolution to the Council of Nicaea. And the papal usurpers simply added to it to justify their temporal power and their rise to supremacy among the bishops uh, to, to acquire to itself the title of Bishop of Bishops. First of all, Constantine, not the Pope, called that council into existence. It was attended equally by all the bishops under the, uh, under the Roman Empire. And the Bishop of Rome didn't even show up. He sent two priests who merely observed the, the, uh, uh, the goings-on of the council and reported back to the Pope. But the Pope has blown the thing completely out of proportion and, and made it sound as though he was the one who called the council. He's the one who settled the dispute and thereby acquired to himself and proved his divine right to rule the church, all the churches. Okay. Now, with that as a setup, we'll continue closing this portion of the chapter. It says, it is, uh, it is not often that so much con uh, convincing evidence is found accumulated upon one point as there is upon this. So overwhelming is it that no writer of the present day, unless he be a Jesuit, will venture to hazard the loss of his reputation for veracity by assigning any other than 20 as the number of the Nicene Canons. One of the most recent investigators of this question among the learned divines of England is Dr. E.B. Pusey, who published a few years ago a history of all the councils from the assembly at Jerusalem in 51 A.D. to the Council of Constantinople in 381. Having before him all the authorities bearing on the question, he fixes the number of Nicene canons at 20, without seeming to suppose the matter debatable. Yet directly in the face of all of this, this Jesuit defender of the primacy and infallibility of the Pope unblushingly publishes a false and forged canon, which he calls the 29th to prove that the Council of Nice thereby declared the Bishop of Rome to be, quote, Christ's vicegerent in the government of the church, unquote, and, quote, the head of the patriarchs as well as Peter was, unquote. Can bold effrontery be carried further? The forgery whenever and by whomsoever made, is bold and entire, made out of whole cloth. There's not a single word by any of the early quote-unquote fathers that can be tortured by the utmost genu uh, ing ingenuity into such a meaning. On the contrary, we have seen that where the Bishop of Rome is spoken of in the sixth canon, he is referred to in no other he is merely called by that title, as all the other bishops are called by their titles, without any indication of preference to him over the others. He's never spoken of as, quote-unquote, Christ's vicegerent, or as, quote-unquote, head of the patriarchs, or, uh, nor is the Church of Rome ever alluded to as the, quote-unquote, apostolic church. It cannot be too frequently repeated that this 29th canon is a downright forgery, one by which the world has been already sufficiently imposed upon. It has been clung to by the supporters of the Pope as against the rights of the whole church, because they know that if deprived of evidence that the first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea, sustained their theory of papal infallibility, it necessarily falls to the ground. That it did not sustain it 
and that there's no that there was no pretense of its existence then is absolutely incontestable. And that concludes that chapter, chapter 10 of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. And R.W. Thompson says, after reviewing this history, and in agreement with so many of the historians, that the Pope was regarded as Bishop of Bishops, or the Prince of the Church, or the, 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 the Pope, the divine right and infallible Pope, is incontestable. Nothing of the kind took place at that council. There was no special treatment of the Pope, who was absent during the council. He was simply a bishop of bishops. But that's not what we see in the world today. We see the Pope ruling the bishops. We see the Pope even ruling the Protestant churches, the the ecumenical churches, which seeks peace and unity with the Roman Catholic Church, and we see the Pope again, once again, just as in the old world order, ruling over the kings of the earth. Now, we're going to continue with chapter 11 of the book. We're going to talk about Peter's claim to primacy. We're going to talk about the temporal power of the Pope that there was no temporal power possessed by the Apostle Peter. We're going to talk about the alliance between Pepin and Zachary. Now, these are important historical uh, uh, elements to our further understanding of the fraud that is the papacy. We're going to talk about a double conspiracy. The Pope released the allegiance of the French people. That's right, the Pope has the power to release people of any nation from their allegiance to their lawfully elected governments. You might find that hard to believe, but that is, the, that is a fact, and it's demonstrated repeatedly throughout history. And one would have to be intoxicated beyond belief not to suppose that the Pope still has the same power. And he's willing to use it again, and I assert that he's going to use it in this country. Now, he made King Pepin king. We're going to talk about the Lombards of Italy. The Pope bargained with Pepin and was guilty of revolt against the empire. That's right, the Pope led a rebellion against the rightful uh, uh, emperor. And Pepin seized territory from the Lombards and gave it to the Popes. And that's where we get the, the, uh, the, the uh, Papal States and the creation of the Pope as not a mere ecclesiastical head of the uh, member of the church, but a temporal king, where he wears a crown and he has a scepter and he rules the people. This is the first time in history where it was established. We're talking about both were revolutionists and traitors, that is, Pepin and the Pope. The Pope usurped what belonged to the empire. He was a usurper. He's still a usurper. He not only usurped usurps the throne of the emperor, but he usurps the throne of Christ himself. Pepin did not conquer Rome, the divine right of kings. This is important. Pepin's second visit, Pope sent letters from him to the Virgin, uh, from the Virgin Mary, and Peter, etc. This is amazing. And he affirms his gift to the Pope. Charlemagne, Adrian I, he absolves the Franks from all crimes in Bavaria. There's another uh, att attempt of the Pope to uh, rule the people over the, the rightful king of the country. And he makes Charlemagne the emperor. He, co he completes the papal rebellion against the empire. Charlemagne confirmed Pepin's gift of the papal states. He did not grant any temporal dominion in Rome, and he dictates the Filioque in the Creed. It's a busy, busy sub, uh, uh, number of subjects that we're going to address in this chapter, and they're all very important to our understanding of what is now known today as the papacy. The greatest usurpation and fictitious 
most powerful institution in the world today. Despite all of these horrendous usurpations and fabrications and lies, it is believed to be the, the vicegerent or the replacement of Christ on earth. It's a colossal human institution and has no divine right sanction whatsoever. And we're going to prove it. Now, the author begins by saying, All inquiry into the origin and history of the temporal power, the, that is, the kingly power of the popes, is necessarily attended with difficulty. It often requires a very discriminating judgment to separate the facts from conjecture, that which is true from myths and fables. One reason for this is found in the fact that the papal writers are not agreed among themselves, either in reference to their real source, the time of its origin, or the precise occasion and manner of its recognition by the church. This of itself excites in an intelligent mind a reasonable doubt of its legitimacy. For however derived, there would be, if it were legitimate, some landmarks to verify its title. Yet, if it were divine, as Pope Pius IX now asserts, there would be undoubtedly some word or act of Christ, or of his apostles, or of the primitive Christians during the first centuries, to attest a fact of such importance, especially as it is now required that it should be accepted as a necessary part of the true faith. If conferred by the nations, the temporal power of the Pope, if it was conferred by the nations instead of God, the author is inferring here, if it was conferred by the nations to preserve themselves from anarchy, some distant historic record would have been made of it as a guide to future ages. In the absence of any convincing proof upon these points, the impartial mind will naturally run into the conclusion that its origin was at least suspicious. And if it is found that it had no existence in the apostolic age and was not recognized as any part of the early Christian system, this other conclusion must inevitably follow that it is the product of human ambition, resting upon authority which the popes have wrenched from the nations by illegitimate means and not upon any divinely, conf divine, not upon any divinely conferred upon Peter or the Church of Rome. When the Apostle Peter, in anticipation of the approaching end of his life, wrote to the Christians of Asia Minor, he affectionately admonished the elders or ancients as an equal, not as a superior in the papal sense, and was careful to tell them that in feeding their flocks they should not be, quote, lords over God's heritage, unquote, or as the Douay version has, has it, should not be, quote, domineering over the clergy, unquote, but that all Christians, old and young, should be clothed with, quote, humility, unquote. You don't see Peter acting like a pope and lording it over the people like the Nicolaitans did. Okay? So Peter did not act that way, yet the pope does, claiming to be Peter's successor. Note very carefully what it says in the Scripture and how Peter uh, treats himself in relation to all other Christians. Very humble. And he commands all bishops to be like him. That is not the character of the papacy. The papacy claims not only to rule every man, woman, and child on this earth, but over the kings of the earth as well. And as divine right, the solemn, sovereign, and final authority on earth, he rules with a rod of iron. That is not the way Peter ruled in Jerusalem. That is not the way Paul ruled over the churches that he established. The papacy is in complete contrast 
to the apostolic age, and it's time for all Americans especially, and Christians all over the world, to recognize the, the huge uh, uh, usurpation that the papacy is, that it is not originated from divinity. It is a human invention, and it rules by human means. Now, he continues, he claimed to be the he claimed, that is, Peter claimed to be only an elder himself and assumed no authority whatsoever beyond that possessed by the other apostles, the authority to counsel and advise those to whom he wrote, that he should not be, quote, that they should not be, quote, led away with the error of the wicked, unquote, or fall from their, quote, own steadfastness, unquote. With this fact kept in mind, we should be the better able to understand the history already detailed and to interpret that which follows. Glancing, then, at the centuries immediately following the age of Constantine, we find nothing better established than that the thrones of the European nations were disposed of by fraud, violence, and bloodshed. They were at the mercy of those monarchs who had the heaviest legions and were the most skillful in crime, especially those who were adepts in murder and assassination. By these means, one line of kings was terminated and another established. As interest or policy dictated, the people all the while being transferred from master to master with no other change in the character of their slavery than that which arose out of a change of tyrants. Clovis the Great, who terminated the d dominion of papal, uh, uh, excuse me, of pagan Rome in Gaul by the Battle of Soissons uh, in the year 486, established the French monarchy and the Merovingian line of kings. His descendants, by regular hereditary succession, held the crown for more than two centuries and a half. Childeric III was the last king of that line, and when we reach the termination of his reign, we begin to stand on solid ground in our inquiry into the origin of the temporal power of the popes. The incidents connected with that event are inseparably associated also with the growth of the papacy, and in no other way than, than by and an accurate understanding of them can we see how its enormous power has been acquired, how, by the successful union of church and state, the divine right to govern the nations and to dispose of crowns and peoples has been established and perpetuated. Childeric III was the legitimate heir to the throne of France and held it by virtue of the, the established and recognized law of the monarchy, there having been no break in the regular line of succession from Clovis for 250 years. Pepin, son of Charles Martel, held the office of Mayor of the Palace, which placed him next to, but not upon, the throne. For 50 or 60 years, his family had furnished to, to France some of the most distinguished leaders of her armies, and Pepin was in no sense inferior to any who had preceded him. So now we've come up on the break, and we'll continue our story of how Pepin rose to power in France and then helped the Pope gain a rebellion against the, 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 the emperor in the east in Constantinople. It's an incredible story, and we'll tell it right after this. Now, beginning where we <clears throat> left off, Childeric III was the legitimate heir to the throne of France and held it by virtue of the established and recognized law of the monarchy, there having been no break in the regular line of succession from Clovis from two, for 250 years. Pepin, son of Charles Martel, held the office of mayor of the palace, which placed him next to, but not upon, the throne. For fifty or sixty years, his family had furnished the French some of the most distinguished leaders of her armies, 
and Pepin was no was in no sense inferior to any who had preceded him. Childeric was a feeble prince, but he was the lawful king, and Pepin, stimulated by his ambition, conceived the purpose of supplanting him and placing the crown upon his own head. The plan, however, was more easily formed than executed, as notwithstanding his effeminacy, Childeric was esteemed on the ground that of him being an immediate descendant of the great Clovis. This fact forbade any resort to direct violence or force by Pepin, but his genius enabled him to contrive other effective means, the first of the kind known in history. Like all the descendants of Charles Martel, he was a champion of Christianity and sympathized with the popes in their efforts to terminate their allegiance to the eastern emperors. In other words, the popes wanted to get out from underneath Constantinople. Remember, Constantine left Rome and made his the center of his power Constantinople. He even named the town after him. And so Rome and the popes remained subjects to the successors of Constantine in Constantinople, and the popes wanted out from under that authority. Remember, the apostle told us that there was a restrainer that kept the man of sin from being revealed. And when that restrainer was taking out, taken out of the way, the, the man of sin, the son of perdition, would be revealed. This was Constantine, and Constantine was removed from Rome and went to Constantinople, and thus uh, leaving a power vacuum, somewhat of a power vacuum in Rome, and the popes looked for an opportunity to divorce themselves from the authority at Constantinople and create their own kingdom that would eventually rule the world. And that's where the man of sin was revealed, the growth of the papacy, is that man. Now, it says, like all the descendants of Charles Martel, Pepin was a champion of Christianity and sympathized with the popes in their efforts to terminate their allegiance to the eastern emperors. And hence, he conceived the idea of bringing to his aid the author of the, ch the authority, rather, of the Church of Rome to enable him to accomplish his ambitious plans. He therefore sent ambassadors to Pope Zachary, soliciting him to employ his, uh, this authority to release the people of France from their allegiance to, the Chil to Childeric in direct disregard of the laws of France and to transfer the crown to him. What had the Church of Rome or its pope to do with the internal and domestic affairs of France, or with the allegiance of the people of France to the legitimate possessor of its throne. Unquestionably, there is no other fair construction to be put upon the conduct of Pepin than it was an invention to uh, an invitation to the pope to become a joint revolutionary conspirator with him against the lawful government of France. All right, Pepin, a subject of the French government, seeking to overthrow the Merovingian king, got together with the Pope and said, Hey, let's lead a revolution here. We can both benefit from this. And that's what this is, a revolution, an unlawful usurpation. Now it says, and both Pepin and, the po and Pope Zachary so understood it as is manifest from their subsequent conduct, especially from the promptness with which the latter interfered in behalf of the former by the employment of his ecclesiastical power of absolution. And here's a case of the papacy violating the sanctity of confession and using it as a means to achieve a political end. Okay? Now, we've already seen that private confession into, an ear, into the ear of a priest is also a usurpation. In the apostolic age, when, when uh, uh, 
confession was made, it was often made publicly. When sins were conducted in a public manner, they were confessed in a public manner, and the whole Christian community took part in the restoration of a soul to the faith. But now the papacy, through its priests, have created the confessional, and they, they, they confess their sins to the priests. And now the priests have an opportunity to use those confessions to plan, such as we see here, a revolution. And it says, And both Pepin and Pope Zachary so understood it, as is manifest from their subsequent conduct, especially from the promptness <clears throat> with which the latter interfered in behalf of the former, by the employment of his ecclesiastical power of absolution. At that time, the Pope was a subject of the Eastern emperors, the successors of Constantine. And it will appear in the sequel that he, he the more readily lent his high authority to this end, because he saw in the success of Pepin the promise of erecting a power in the West, which he, or his successors, could employ in sundering their own allegiance to the Eastern Empire. So he's going to help Pepin overthrow uh, the, the rightful government through the, the power of the Pope, the ecclesiastical power, and then, and then turn around and once the Pope becomes a king, then to lead a rebellion against the Eastern Empire and thereby liberate the Pope to do as he pleases. It's very ingenious war strategy here. It says his reasoning was doubtless this, that if Pepin, by his ecclesiastical aid, that is the Pope's ecclesiastical aid, could make treason against Childeric successful in France, then he, by the aid of Pepin, might make his own successful against the empire to which Rome belonged. Whatever the motive, however, the fact is attested by the unanimous voice of history that Pepin did become king of France only by the aid of the Pope's exercise of spiritual authority as head of the Roman Church, which he unscrupulously employed for that purpose while he was himself the subject of and owed temporal allegiance to another monarch. Seemingly unconscious of the obligation which rested upon him to keep the church pure and uncontaminated, and not to employ the sacred things of religion for mere worldly and ambitious ends, he entered into the schemes of Pepin with the greatest alacrity. Without stopping to count the cost, either to religion or the church, he complied with Pepin's request in a manner which must have been exceedingly gratifying to him, and which placed him under obligations he was subsequently quite ready to recognize. In violation of the hereditary and legal right of, the, of Childeric, in direct opposition to the established laws of France, he issued his papal brief absolving the people from their allegiance and transferring the crown to Pepin, the ambitious and revolutionary usurper. So here we have the Bishop of Rome writing a letter to all the Christians of France saying you must rebel against Childeric and crown Pepin your king. Now might this happen today? Might the Pope issue a brief either publicly or privately to the Catholics of this country to overthrow our Constitution and establish a papal kingdom? That's exactly what has happened in this country. And it's going to get worse. Most people don't recognize what's happening in this country as being a tactic of Rome to come to ultimate supremacy of authority in this country. But that's exactly what's happening. Now, as if he actually wielded the authority of God himself, he went even one step farther than this, by prohibiting the French people from ever thereafter exercising any freedom of choice in the election of their king, or from ever depriving the Carlovingian princes of the crown. 
that is the descendants of Charles Martel. So not only are they going to overthrow the government of uh, France, the legal government of France, the Merovingian kings, they're going to replace them with the Carlovingians. And they're going to forbid the French people from ever exercising their choice again in electing any other king but that which the Pope picks. It says, Gibbon, the historian, speaking of this extraordinary use of spiritual power, says, quote, The Franks were absolutely from their ancient, uh, excuse me, the Franks were absolved from their ancient oath. But a dire anathema was thundered against them, and their, post and, their po and their posterity dare to renew the same in freedom of choice or to elect a king, except in the holy and meritorious race of the Carlovingian princes. That, uh, uh, unquote. And it says, that is, having thus been brought under the spiritual dominion of the Pope to such an extent as to allow him to dictate their domestic policy and dispose of their crown, the curse of God would rest upon, would rest upon them if ever thereafter the French people should dare to repeat the act of electing a king except in the interest of the papacy and with the consent of the popes. Is that what Peter established? Is that what God intended for his people? That a bishop, a mere bishop, would rise to the level of power and meddling in, in other nations' internal affairs and dictate the policy, not just policy and law, but to dictate who their king would be? And this defines all of the medieval history. The Pope, the great usurper of God's throne, and the overthrow of God's people to become king of kings and lord of lords on the earth. A biblical and historical antichrist. He continues, he says, a monarchy thus established could not be otherwise than devoted to the Pope. You see what that's all about? If the Pope picks the kings, then all the kings owe their allegiance to the Pope and not to the people and not to the nations that they rule. That's how you build a global empire. That's how the Popes built their global empire during the Middle Ages. And that's how the popes will restore their global, uh, their global empire in the New World Order. Michelet, speaking of it, says, quote, This monarchy of Pepins, founded by the priests, was devoted to the priests, unquote. There's no dispute about the main facts thus far. A modern Roman Catholic historian in the United States has put them in a succinct form. And while he endeavors to convey the idea that it was altogether right and proper for the Pope to absolve the French people from their allegiance to Childeric, yet he narrates the circumstances with commendable fairness and impartiality. The ecclesiastical historians are not less distinct in their statements. Dr. Waddington, referring to the usurpation of Pepin, says, quote, this occurrence is generally related as the first instance of the temporal ambition of the Vatican, or at least of its inference with the inter, excuse me, its interference with the rights of princes and the allegiance of subjects. Unquote. So we're setting a precedent. This is the first time in history that the papacy has this far used its temporal authority to literally command the people of an entire nation to overthrow its government, its lawfully seated government. And another historian, Cormenon, condemns the Pope in decided language and charges that he sent letters to Pepin, quote, encouraging him in his ambitious projects and authorizing him in the name of religion to depose Childeric III and to take possession of the crown. Unquote. This political religious, this political, meaning state 
and religious, meaning church. In other words, when you hear the term political, religious, or religio-political, you're talking about a church-state union where the church gets in bed with the state and the state gets in bed with the church to together rule the people. This is how the Pope ruled the world. It was a political religious system. It says, This political religious alliance between Pepin and the Pope has most important aspects which cannot escape observation. On the part of the Pope, it was the assertion of the divine right to dispose of the crown of, of France without regard to the wishes of the French people and to compel and to compel them to obey him in the subsequent manage of their own affairs. And it was equivalent to the assumption of like authority over all other nations and peoples. Okay? It was a precedent. And it was equivalent to the assumption that the Pope could do this in France, he could do it in every nation in the world. Command in the name of religion... In the name of the Roman Catholic Church and the divine right of the Pope and the infallibility of the Pope, in the name of the Pope and the name of religion to overthrow your governments and to seat upon the throne a crown of the Pope, a, a king of the Pope's choosing, it was equivalent to the assumption of like authority over all other nations and peoples. This is a claim before which the temporal power in the papal states is dwarfed into insignificance. And yet the Pope did not even possess this at the time of this extraordinary assumption. Manifestly, it could not be conceded to him all the nations at his feet, and without taking away from the people, wherever they possessed it, the power to make their own laws, select their own agents to execute them, and to regulate their own domestic affairs. And it should not be overlooked in view of this enormity that it is precisely this same divine power to which Pope Pius IX now lays claim. With him there can be no higher or better evidence of right than the exercise of it by one of his infallible predecessors. And there will be no impediment to its universal recognition whenever mankind shall be brought to the concession that the church, through her infallible head, defines her own powers and her own jurisdiction. The alliance began to bear its legitimate fruits without much delay. The Lombards had seized upon and held a great part of Italy, including the province of Ravenna, the capital of which, as the former residence of the great Ostrogothic king Theodoric and of the Greek exarchs, had grown into rivalry with Rome. This territory belonged to the Eastern Empire, whose emperors, it is alleged by the defenders of the papacy, were either not disposed or too feeble to defend, uh, to defend it, and had been held about two years by its Lombard conquerors. But Astolphus, the Lombard king, was not satisfied with these possessions and threatened to seize upon Rome, which still belonged to the empire. The pope, being unwilling to let Rome be brought under the dominion of the Lombards, fearing that its ecclesiastical power would be transferred to Ravenna, the papacy by the... Uh, and the papacy be thereby made subordinate to the exarchate, inaugurated immediate measures for resistance. Those who justify the exercise of temporal, uh, of temporal power by the popes say that he peti petitioned the emperors to send, uh, excuse me, to send assistance to Rome to repel the contemplated attack of Astolphus. Dr. Fred, uh, Fredit, this uh, esteemed historian, <clears throat> being too candid to deny that Rome then belonged to the emperors of Constantinople, he says, but admitting that that uh, admitting that fact says, quote, Pope Stephen, excuse me, uh, 
a bit of a, th- a frog in my throat this morning. I apologize to my listeners. I'll, I'll try again. Dr. Fredit, the historian, being too candid to deny that Rome then, quote, belonged to the emperors of Constantinople, unquote, but admitting that fact says, quote, Pope Stephen sent to implore necessary suckers, that's S-U-C-C-O-R-S, that is those, suckers means those who give aid and comfort. He says, Pope Stephen sent to implore necessary suckers, those who would give aid and comfort, from Constantine Copronymus, in whose name the government of Rome was still existed, unquote. These suckers, <clears throat> those who give aid and comfort, if called for, were not furnished. And the same author, in, assign- in assigning the reason, says that, the, that, quote, the emperor was too deeply engaged in warring against the images of the saints to think of sending troops against the Lombards, unquote. Okay, still having trouble with that frog. <laughs> Again, my apologies. Okay, the, the emperor of Constantinople was was too busy fighting with the uh, <clears throat> fighting with the uh, the church to come to the aid of Rome, is what they're saying. Now, whatever the precise facts may have been, the question lay between the Roman people, in whose name the pope acted, and the emperor, to whom as subjects they owed allegiance by the existing laws of nations. The Pope, as a subject, also owed his allegiance to no less than the people. Now, the Pope, I want my listeners to understand, the Pope is no less a subject to the Emperor of Constantinople as were the people. Okay, so much for the great, great power of the Pope. The Pope was expected to obey the Emperor, just as were the people. Okay, this man of sin has not yet quite come out of his his uh, his birth, if you might uh, accept. It says the Pope, as a subject, also owed his allegiance no less than the people. His power was exclusively, that is, entirely ecclesiastical, and possessed none over temporal or political matters. Whatsoever he did in reference to these, he did necessarily as a subject. Okay, the Pope's nobody yet. And it says he could not get rid of the obligation of his allegiance by any act short of revolt against legitimate authority. In other words, the man of sin couldn't be revealed unless he revolted. He started a revolution against the lawful emperor in Constantinople. And this relation in which he and the Roman people stood to the emperor must be kept in mind in order to understand the full bearing of the cons- uh, excuse me, the full bearing of the subsequent events out of which the temporal power of the popes arose. Dr. Fredit, referring to the condition into which the people were thrown by the neglect of emperors, also says, quote, In this extremity, the Romans embraced the last resource which was left them, that of calling the valiant monarch of the French to their assistance, unquote. And upon the same subject, he says in another place, quote, thus finding implacable enemies both in the barbarians, that is the Lombards, and in their own sovereigns, that is Constantinople, the people, driven almost to despair, began to sigh ardently after a new and better order of things. And that order of things, then called a new world order, we know as the old world order, where the Pope, the usurper, became King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we'll talk about this more tomorrow on the broadcast.